we're going to talk about responsive web design today. Uh, if you know anything about me or about my alter internet ego, Snugug, you will know that I like responsive web design, along with a variety of other things. But today we're just going to do a brief top level overview of responsive web design. So uh, what is responsive web design? Why do we need it? Well, a couple of years ago, the, a wonderful thing happened to the web. The iPhone came out. Now, say what you will about Apple or Steve Jobs or Apple versus Android versus Microsoft, but the one thing that the iPhone did that no one else had done so far is they, it really brought the web, the full web, to people's pockets for the very first time, at least in the mass US market. And with that came a little bit of a problem. All of our websites and all of our web theories and all of our web best practices up until that point had been centered around the idea that the only place anyone's ever going to view a website is sitting in front of their computer on a screen about 1024 by 768 or larger. So all of our design tools and web tools and web ideas really were built around this, uh, this concept. So we came up with things, awesome things, like the 960 grid system, which gave us a static, uh, a static grid to build with that will fit most people who would ever come to our site. Of course, if we can do math, the original iPhone screen, and still today, the, original, the iPhone screen is 320 pixels wide, which means that if we have a 960 pixel site, it can't quite all fit onto 320 pixels. This is a problem because this prevents us, this is where pinch and zoom comes from and why it's really hard to read desktop websites, specifically desktop websites and all of our old interactions like Hover, we have relied as a community on Hover for so long. Um, all that stuff kind of goes away because when you're on a small screen with just a finger, you can't do any of the, uh, basically all of our best practices flew out the window. Then about two, two and a half years ago, a guy named Ethan Marcote published this article on a list apart called Responsive Web Design. And in it, he postulated three things. It's, it's basically the building blocks for, for modern web development, future-friendly web development. And it postulates three things. The first thing is that for a responsive site, we need a fluid grid. We need fluid media. And we need media queries to allow us to change our layout at different sizes. So uh, some of this stuff had been around, some of this hadn't. Fluid images had been around for a while. Fluid videos, not so much, but it turns out that HTML5 video worked very similarly to regular images, max width 100%. Fluid grids we had forever. In fact, the web naturally is based on fluid grids, or fluidity, and it's us who have imposed rigidity on it. So we already had that. The one piece of the puzzle we were missing, which we wound up getting in CSS3, are media queries. Media queries are CSS-based things that actually come from CSS2, but were enhanced using in CSS3, to allow us to query more than just the media, but uh, to query specific pieces of media. So for instance, in CSS2, and I'm sure people have done this, you could do at media print in order to target print styles for a print style sheet. Now what we can do with media queries is we can do at media, for instance, screen to target screen devices. But then we could also do and min with 524 pixels. Media queries, what this media query does is the first one just targets print. The second one targets screen media, but will only match if the width of the screen or of the viewport really is less than 524 pixels. Now with this, we get the power to go and change our layouts as we change our sizes. So we could have a small screen layout, we could have a large screen layout or a slightly larger screen layout, and we could have a really big layout. And more importantly, be able to have 
our layouts change at the different sizes. Now, that was great. Uh, there's one big drawback to this, and the drawback is IE 8 and below doesn't support this. So what a lot of people decided to do was they decided to, instead of using min width, use max width. Now what max width does is, instead of going from here to there to there, start, is it smaller than this? Is it smaller than this? Is it smaller than, or is, sorry, is our screen larger than this using min width? It's, is our screen smaller than this using max width? Using max width, we get our desktop, and I'm going to put that in quotes because it's not really desktop, it's large screen or large viewport. Our desktop layout will stay, and then we'll build smaller as we go. This allows, this is what's called a desktop first approach to responsive web design. And this was very popular when it first came out because it allowed for backwards compatibility with IE8 and below, and it was easy to retrofit current sites with. Now, that's fine and all, but that's not really our best practice. With responsive web design, what we really want to do is we really want to go mobile first. Now, Luke Roblowski, Luke W on the internet, he came up with, he's been championing this idea of mobile first for a while. And when you start to sit down and think about it, it makes a lot of sense. So let's draw a banana. If we have a banana in a large screen, And then we make a small screen. Sorry, I'm standing in front of the camera. Our banana is still the same size, roughly. But it's starting to get a little bit squished. When we go to our small screen size, we now have a banana that really doesn't fit. We're trying to cram stuff down into our mobile first, or into our mobile size, and that leads to bad UX and bad UI decisions and a cluttered interface, and generally not good, uh, not good experience for the user. But if we start mobile first, we can take our banana, and as the sizes increase, it's easier for us to deal with. We've started with the constraints of mobile and have gotten larger. Now, why is this important? Well, this is important because as of right now, 25% of all US adults, possibly even more at this point, primarily use their mobile devices for internet browsing as opposed to a desktop device or a large screen device. Even more importantly, that number is growing substantially. Um, according to Luke Roblowski, there are around four times the number of mobile device activations per day than human births, possibly even higher at this point. So the future really is mobile. But it's not even quite mobile. This is fine. What a lot of people have done is they've said, awesome, mobile, that means 320 pixels, right? Because that is my iPhone. Tablet, that's 768, because that's my iPad in portrait. They may have something in between here, which was 480 pixels for the iPhone in portrait. And then desktop, we can start at 1024, because that is our iPad in landscape and a fairly common desktop size. That's great. We have four breakpoints. And that's what we can use for everything. The happiest day of my responsive career was when the iPhone 5 came out and was a different size. Because it, means, it meant that all of these 480 breakpoints now are totally broken. Anyone who targeted mobile at four, uh, 480 pixels was blown out of the water. I believe it's 568 something now. Um, and well, this whole idea, this is what's called, uh, this is what's colloquially known as adaptive design, um, kind of was blown out of the water, uh, especially for iPhone. Now, 
When you get into Android, it's even worse. When I ask you what the size, what the average Android phone size is, if you give me an answer, you're wrong. <laughs> they run the gamut literally from 240 pixels through 1920 pixels for, uh, for the long width or for whatever width they might be browsing on, which means that you have Android devices who have mobile Android devices that have larger screen sizes than most desktop devices. Uh, so that kind of messes everyone up, um, especially if you decide to target experiences towards specific screen sizes. Uh, assuming device based on screen size is totally, totally the wrong thing to do. It runs counterintuitive to what is actually true. So, how do we deal with this? How do we deal with getting our content to look right and behave properly across a range of devices? Well, there are two things that we can do. The first thing that we can do is we can, instead of using user agent sniffing to figure out what device we're on, which is a really bad practice because it's really easy to spoof and doesn't actually tell us what we want, we can use feature detection. And my favorite feature detection library is Modernizer. Modernizer.com, I believe. Modernizer is a little JavaScript library that you can throw in your, your, the head of your file, or the head of your HTML. Doesn't run on any, li any C or JavaScript framework, so it's totally, Java, uh, it's totally independent. You can use it anywhere. And you can check off which pieces you'd like, including awesome things like touch and SVG. So instead of assuming a small screen size has touch, or instead of uh, sniffing for a, u for a iPhone user agent, you can use Modernizer. And you can use in JavaScript the object modernizer.touch. And that will return a Boolean true or false if touch is supported. You could also, Modernizer also appends classes to the HTML tag. So you could, in your CSS, write dot touch, T-O-U-C-H, I can spell, and then selector, or dot no touch selector. And be able to, through the use of modernizer and a little bit of old school parent, uh, parent selecting in CSS, be able to target your CSS to touch a no touch. And that way, you can target experiences to features that are available as opposed to user agents. That's great. But how do we pick screen sizes? Where, where are our breakpoints? Um, in the various communities I'm a part of, uh, there have been a lot of discussion on breakpoints. What are my site's breakpoints? Uh, now, personally for me, there's no such thing as a site-wide breakpoint. There's two or three places where you'd ever have a site-wide breakpoint. Potentially, and really it boils down to when you change your base font size, if you do font scaling, and even so that might not actually affect your entire site. It will visually, but not really affect each individual element. If you change your grid, that will affect every element on the page more or less. Uh, and if you change major layouts, so if you go from like a single column layout to a multi-column layout, whether how you should handle layouts and what single column and multi column mean in a responsive world is a totally different story that we'll get to later, maybe. But the question is, where do you set breakpoints? And the answer is, when doing responsive web design, you need to design in browser. There is no single solution. There is no set of five breakpoints that you can use and have everything work. The point of responsive web design isn't to make your site look good on devices. It's to make your content look good anywhere. So what does this mean? This means that you need to get into browser as fast as possible with real content. And then in Chrome or Safari or Firefox or IE9 or IE10, not IE8, but IE9 or IE10, whichever one you develop in. I personally prefer Chrome, but it's up to you. Get your stuff in there. Make your site really small. Remove all of your CSS. Turn all of your CSS off. With all of your CSS off, your source order should be your single column small screen layout. 
period. You shouldn't need to rearrange anything, shouldn't need to dive into Flexbox to move an image up above some text. Your source order is your single column layout. Then what you do is you increase, you grab your little pointer, you grab your, the corner of your browser, and you increase the size. And I'm going to quote Stephen Hay here. Uh, start with your small screen first. Expand till it looks like shit. Time for a breakpoint. And that's what you do. Each little piece of your site, when it looks bad, write a breakpoint there. How do I figure out what the size is? This is why I like Google Chrome so much. You open up your web inspector, go to console, and type window.innerwidth. It will autocomplete for you if you forget it, but window.innerwidth. And that will spit you out your viewport size in pixels of where your screen currently sits. So you can sit and you can pull your browser open. Something looks bad, window.innerwidth, figure out, or copy whatever that result is, put it into a breakpoint, put it into your CSS, and keep going. And what you're going to wind up having is, instead of a whole bunch of site-wide um, media queries, you're going to wind up having a bunch of small media queries that tweak little things here and there as you go along. And what that will provide for you is, instead of having your site look good on the iPhone and the iPad, but the moment that your boss with the new BlackBerry or new Android device comes out, goes and says, oh no, this looks crap, it'll be, your site looks good everywhere. And your content, or specifically your content, looks good everywhere. So really, that's the gist of responsive web design. It's get in browser, mobile first, Make sure that your content look good, looks good everywhere because pretty soon your primary browser is not going to be your desktop browser. And for many of us techies, it's not right now. So that's why you need responsive web design. Uh, thank you.